And we're going to kick off by uh, giving on a shot at the restricted list. Myself and Justin got to talk about it last week. FFG have now officially released it. And uh, all the, the crazy rumors and speculation were spot on. So, Owen, tell us, tell us why rebuild is a terrible thing to put on the restricted list. Um, so, on one level, I'm okay with rebuild being on there just because like, maybe it means that they're putting out some. The crab holdings that have come out are a really, really mixed bag. Cooney Labs, fabulous. Iron Mines, fabulous. A lot of the rest of them are a lot more questionable. And maybe that was a bit of a concern about the power level of rebuild. Um, I, I kind of feel like it was put on there sort of as a, well, this is potentially a deck and this is a powerful card, so let's tone it down right now. Because it is probably the best trick in Crab's arsenal, but Crab's Fate arsenal is pretty anemic anyway. So, you know, that hurts, but I mean, some of this looks like the restricted list as a whole is an attempt to tamp down everybody, which is not as necessarily the best way to do it, but we'll see how it works out. They definitely hit, for the most part, a lot of targets people would approve of them hitting. Uh, there's definitely a concerted effort to at least prune Dragon to two farms. The the good stuff, uh, instead of good stuff dot deck, where you've got the lots of attachment deck, and then you've got the monk deck, and they're sort of meant to be at least a little separate. Uh, you've got as well Scorpion being hit, Face Worth and Death on there, Forged Edict on there, like making them make big choices there. And Young Rumor Munger, who I assume just drops out of decks now because... Yeah, you're not going to give up a fate worse than death and and for cheating for him, plus anything else you were going to splash. Yeah, definitely so, an interesting okay. choice. Yeah. Like, it's weird because he's not the best card that Scorpion have in that slot. Um, That's by Shalire. But I assume there was some combo-ish shenanigans or something that warranted him as the target. I mean, the problem is that Scorpion's character base is really too strong anyway. And this is going to be, it's going to be difficult for them to fix it with this. Uh, but yeah, we'll see what happens. Pathfinder's Blade's still on there, I assume, just still because of Dragon. Um, much more than Crack, you know, Crab would love to use it, but, you know, they have to use Seeker of Earth to do that. And I imagine most Crab are going to play Keeper of Water, this is fodder for the unicorn deck, though. I still think if the if the weenie deck gets a couple more decent bodies and a couple of good sack techniques, we could really start that seeing that making waves. Uh, oh. Void twist is an obvious hit because it's super powerful. Yeah. But yeah. Go on. Our, our charge is charge iron mine reprieve back on the the board for crowd. It's, it's it was always kind of it was always you could always still go charge and reprieve. Um, I've played charge in some decks because I wasn't running Iron Mine because I was running Cooney Labs instead. So there was some value to it. Uh, the trick is getting the right mix of characters for it. Um, charge is incredibly high return sometimes and kind of meh otherwise. I think if you see a few more crab characters with some impactful effects on conflicts, you'll start to see Charge come into play a bit more. Rebuild is so, so strong, though, that um, it's going to be tricky for some decks to make the decision not to have it. You kind of you don't get a fundamental rebuild as to some crap shenanigans until you start playing without it. Um, just because, like, getting the Iron Man back at the right moment or getting the um, getting the Kuni Lab back or whatever at the right moment could be absolutely massive. No, it, like, if you think well, there's a is there a decision over it? Well, there is. There absolutely is. But it's going to come down to what what your deck is doing, and uh, with the aggressive upcoming release of cards, I am hopeful we start to see greater deck diversity, greater deck building choices, more choices that people can make about. Hey, I want to include this, and that'll be cool. Um, I interested to see against the waves go off it. Interesting to see. Um, while Muramoto Shuri stayed on. So I suppose it's just looking at well, that's you know, Dragoner riding high and Phoenix are a little low, and it's you know, let's tune things up a bit. I figure this is a working process. 
especially with the aggressive release of cards, I could see us seeing a new restricted list in four or five months, six months maybe. You know, just just to just to tune matters again. Definitely but it's not. definitely hitting some decks from knocking down a page two. And frankly, after Scorpion is just performing so strong, they they have to do something to appear to be, you know, pruning them back a little. But it, it, yeah, Scorpion did win this one. They didn't win the previous one. No, but you know, I, I always look at qualification rates and unbeaten rates rather than anything else for what factions doing well. Those numbers are pretty good for Scorpion. They're pretty good for Scorpion. Yeah. Right. Hey, yeah, that's it. Yeah, makes sense. I'm just looking at the list here. Uh, at least Feast Framen is on now, which is good. Uh, which won't quite. Re it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough for people to make choices. I can see Feast or Famine being caught a bunch. Um, which is tough, tough to justify sometimes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Cool. Crane will have to decide between Feast or Famine or Guest of Honor. I think Guest of Honor is probably going to win. Unicorn have to decide between Feast or Famine and. Charge? Something else? Yeah, sure, I could say. Kind of fair enough. Those, those are decisions you have to make rather than a sure definites. Um, all right, so interesting times ahead. I hope so. It'd be really depressing if they made all these changes and nothing altered. And then the first tournament where we're going to see this live is going to be in Cork. Um, but we still don't know when children of the empire is we do not we did get some release details at uh, madrid game on uh so it's coming out in january which is slightly unhelpfully vague um i'm hoping early january so it's legal so wait what confirmed. what is the margin how how many it's, days do you need it's a week from release isn't it or is it two weeks i think it's a week from I think, release i think it might be a week um, which you know, gives it a, a good chunk of January to to turn up and still be legal because uh, Cork, Kotai, and Phoenix one are both near the very end of the month. Uh, so yeah, that'll be that'll be super interesting if uh, we get a big chunk of cards before going into a tournament. It's actually a really tough one for uh, tournament organizers because you've got to make an announcement a bit in advance about what's going to be legal at the event. Because people will ask, and you want to give them an accurate answer that isn't like you know misleading and all. So you want to say this is going to be legal, and we don't know when it's going to be out exactly. Like if it's out the first week, everyone's like, oh yeah, grand, it's legal. But if it's not, people post Christmas, we're going to start getting questions like, is this legal? Is it not legal? And we'll have to give some sort of response. So it and will then, be. and then of course the nightmare scenario is when uh, it should be legal, but the product got delayed, didn't ship. Yeah. Made made it to some stores, but not all the stores. So uh, exactly at tap wood, that doesn't happen. It'll be all fine. Ooh. Which does give us a, a really big incentive to do a big card review episode. Managed to dodge skip so far the <laughs> the scorpion pack, um. But my God, it looks like uh, Tyler has given us a terrifying year ahead. We have we have a lot of packs. We have uh, a lot of clan packs, and then of course we're going into like Children of the Empire should be a big box, a lot of cards in there to review, like days days of podcasting. They're a bit more spread out this time, though. It's not it's not the super concentrated six packs in six weeks, which was the which was just awful. So so what do you what do you think of that, Justin? Because for me, uh, I really enjoyed that one week. When it was just madness. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. I mean, like the, the, the six packs in six weeks. Yeah, that was, I think that was a fantastic idea. Um, basically to, to, to get at the start of the game, at the start of the life, uh, life cycle of the game, um, when like big injections of cards are very, very exciting and quite necessary as well, because they've introduced a lot of change uh, or should do. I think now um, with the, the next cycle, so we're going to have one big box of cards, which will be Children of the Empire. Um, so that's going to um, not, not quite double the amount of cards in the environment, but it adds a significant chunk. Um, and then I think after that, then I think the game is probably mature enough and there's a significant enough card base there that uh, going back to releasing one per month is more than fine. Um, I don't think you need to to, to inject you know, significant numbers of cards very, very quickly anymore. Uh, and yeah, 
uh, honestly, from a review point of view, I'm I'm all on board with it. <laughs> all on board. Uh, slightly more relaxed uh, approach uh, would be more than welcome. But uh, but yeah, like, like tons of stuff to expect in the coming year. Um, uh, yeah, uh, there's just there's just an awful lot. It's uh, really excited. Really looking forward to it. As I'm sure are crane players who are going to get their second stronghold at last. And dragon players will get their second. No, dragon players will have to wait a very, very long time, but they might get a well, no. stronghold and children. Yeah, so Tyler said we, were, we weren't going to get the dragon clan back in time for winter court, but that dragon players mm -hmm. uh, were going to get something nice and they wouldn't be disappointed. So uh, spe speculation is there's going to be another, another stronghold in there somewhere. Um, yeah, just looking at it, so it's May when the cycle starts. Start hitting our, our six packs, starting from there. And then you've got a bundle of events happening up to... So is Gen Con going to hit? So Gen Con's normally August, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. May, June, July, August, September, October. So it'll be in the middle. We'll be still getting a drip feed throughout all of those events, um, which includes Birmingham. Includes Gen Con, probably whatever the event in Poland is going to be, the and the European Champion yeah, FFG Grand, European Championships. Grand Cote kind of yeah, yeah. Um, but but that's that's good as well because it means there is a new meta game for each uh, for each environment, and it's not a matter of really kind of copy pasting decks across from from one major tournament to another. That's what I'm relying on. I know. Well, yeah. I mean, there is. There is the there is that problem, but uh, but yeah, it just means that you know the the environment is going to be changing and shifting as these move on. So it's going to be up to people to potentially spot something that comes out in a pack, um, you know, or maybe something in a new pack that combos with something in an old pack. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's just a, a bit of innovation. And as I said, hopefully, again with the Children of the Empire and more than one archetype being available for all clans then that will lead to an awful lot more deck innovation, um, which is something that we haven't really seen for five rings yet. There's been an awful lot of establishing archetypes and refining archetypes, but there hasn't been, the, the, the card pool hasn't reached a kind of a mature enough stage yet where you can really innovate and create something new and unexpected. So yeah, something to potentially look forward to. I think it's funny that they've done at this stage, every distribution method for it. They've done the six packs in six weeks. They've done the one giant box. They've done one pack a month. So they've stuck with everything. I, I, I hope, you know, in the process of this, they've learned stuff. And like, you know, I, I don't know. We tried everything. Which worked? Well, some of it did. Which parts? I don't know. We'll figure it out later. But it's been interesting that they've gone through it. I mean, they're, I'm half expecting to go, you know, we pick some cards at random, we wrap them in foil, and put them in individual things. You buy, you never know what you're going to get, guys. Yeah, it's like the, it's the, 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 the key forge mentality has crept into five rings. You have no idea. This is like a random selection of, uh, of distribution methods. <laughs> Each turn, you pick one. Yeah. For each oh, yeah, that, you get to, you get to pick your distribution method. That that, that, that leads us into a, into a relatively good topic. Maybe we won't dwell on it too much, but um, we had four fifty players in Madrid last year, and estimates are around two sixty four, sixty five, or something like that. Because uh, it's hard to tell because there's uh, people who went in a day one and the day two, um, which actually we might talk about a bit later. Um, but that's a pretty significant drop. Um, how do we think the Alpha or LCG is doing from a business perspective? Justin. Oh, oh God, I have no idea. Without seeing the, the numbers from FFG HQ, it's really hard to tell. Um, but to be honest, I think we all expected this. I mean, this seems to be you know a feature of FFG and and how they release games. Um, it's a, they've a, they FFG seem a bit like Games Workshop from about fifteen years ago, where everything was hype, hype, hype. Release a new product. Um, get people to buy in, move on to the next product, hype, hype, hype. Um, so there's a degree of churn to be expected. And certainly with something like Keyforge uh, kind of coming out this year and being the, the, the new big product, um, yeah, you're, they're going to be people who are really interested in experiencing the, the, the new big product that FFG have or that they're releasing and that are going to move around. Um, so I think a drop-off was 
always going to happen, uh, especially when five rings turn out to be the kind of game that it is, which is uh, a very, you know, a very mentally demanding one. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be too disappointed. Um, just, you know, uh, you know, going even by by old five ring standards, like a tournament of two hundred and sixty four, two hundred and sixty five players was still pretty fantastic. So, pretty good. Um, yeah, I mean, as I said, uh, I've no idea. I mean, it, you know, the thing is, like, it'll continue on like this probably for another year or two, and then we'll get to five rings version two point at some point, as they did with. Um, with Netrunner, uh, at which point there'll be a huge amount of excitement again, and the game will make a lot more money, a lot more players will come back in, um, and then the life cycle will probably repeat to some degree. Um, you know, games do have finite uh, lifespans, and at some point, Five Rings may no longer be profitable for FFG. I have no idea, but yeah. uh, the fact, that, but the fact that FFG 100% own the the property means that it's probably here to stay for a very long time, and certainly taking a look at the quality of the role-playing uh, products and uh, and yeah and just you know everything like that I mean, and the, the 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 card game as well um i wouldn't say that uh, fft are half-assing this by any stretch of the imagination they seem genuinely dedicated to, to producing a, a top a top quality product so yeah i don't know yeah. you know uh, yeah drop-offs to be expected but um but i wouldn't be i wouldn't be concerned about it in any way and the the way the story is developing and kind of coming together is just when we're talking about Keyforge, I have to admit, I've been playing a little bit of Keyforge myself. I highly recommend it. It's a lot of fun, but it is it is not a lifestyle game, not like um, L5 or it. It's a nice ala cleanser to kind of pick up and put down every so often. Um, but I'll I'll be interested to see if you start getting podcasts or, you know, kind of serious analysis or strategy players sitting down and talking about it. It seems a little lighter than that. So Owen, what do you what do you think about uh, how L5 or is doing in the LTG model? Um I think it was, it's always been a difficult marriage, um, not least because FFG definitely do the thing of this game that we're releasing is the most important game that has ever been released. <laughs> and three months later, there's a new most important game that's ever been released. Like in the L4 release, we've gone through the churn of the new X Ring release. We've gone through, you know, Keyforge. We've gone through, and they just keep cycling in and out. And I kind of get the impression that. The company's got so many plates it's trying to spin at the same time that stuff gets lost in the shuffle. Like when you're in the full glare of you are the featured product of FFG, communication is great. You get tons of information, tons of hype. And then when you're not, you just, you just have to kind of figure stuff out or, you know, find stuff out, crawl through ISBNs or look up, you know, uh, Thing Magazine to see when a product's getting released. Check, I mean, check out the Dread Streams. Spanish yeah. to work out the English parts. Like, I shouldn't need to listen to a stream from a Kodai to find out release dates. That's that's the kind of thing that should be coming out well in advance from, you know, that website that updates, you know, multiple times each week. Uh, it's, it's interesting because I was playing, I went over to Arkham Knights in England. It's the first time they've had an Arkham Knights outside of Minnesota. And it was great fun because we got to sit down and play a bunch of Arkham uh, Horror, the LCG, and Arkham Horror, the board game, the new edition. So it was great. It was in, it was being in a tournament with no stress because we were playing against you know against decks, against you know effectively AI decks rather yeah. than playing against people. So it was just an opportunity to sit down, hang out, have a chat, play some great, great crack. And we we're talking about how like the Arkham Horror stuff seems to sidestep a lot of the you know panopticon we were kind of joking that the arkham horror designers must be hiding in some closet somewhere in ffg's headquarters just churning out their content which we just keep putting out regularly and so long <laughs> as no one comes and bothers us we're okay i like I, I wonder how much of that is true about you know well, we got to do this now the other thing that's has to be a little concerning is i've been kind of waiting for the board gaming bubble to burst a little because we've been at an unsustainable level of production of board games for a while now. Uh, we're at, I think, is it well over 2,000 new games a year at the moment? What Very is crazy. your chances of seeing all the good ones out of that? It's ridiculous. And we're starting to see some slowdown in the big minis Kickstarters. We're starting to see stuff slowing down a little bit. And, and we're, we're, seeing, where, we're seeing companies close as well. Yeah, companies close as well. And 
a huge amount of content IP and you know thing I've centered around FFG, and I'm sure their investment company would like to sell them on, but I'm not sure they can. And you know you've got you know Watsy as well looking to you know maybe make some moves. We're not sure about what they want to do, but I think definitely it's slowing down a little bit. Maybe some of the mad money's gone away. I don't think it's going to be a big massive crash and everything's going to be worthless, but yeah. I think that everything's going to slow down a little bit, thankfully, because it, it was too hectic. You couldn't keep up with all the games. It was ridiculous. I've got games I haven't played yet, uh, and I know they're good, but I haven't got a chance to play them yet. And it would be nice for me to slow down and maybe FFG takes a look at its stock and says, okay, what IPs do we own and we can reliably push, and what IPs are we making, having some very expensive licenses for? Because I can't imagine, like the, the Star Wars license has got to be can't be cheap, and I, they need to. I, I would say I think they might slow down a little bit, and there's going to be changes in leadership in FFG. So, you know. Yeah. So, uh, Christian Peterson. Yeah. So he's stepping out at the end of this year. Yep. Um and what's some other change? Oh, um, Alex Watkins is now yep. head of organized play for North America. So uh, he has been absolutely fantastic over here in Europe. Yep. Um, and actually, one of the things that came up was no one realized that you could play day one and day two, or day one A and day one B of the two qualifier day Grand Codice. And when Alex realized that, he kind of stepped in and uh, smoothed over things and made sure that all the players were happy and everyone was excited, which was fantastic work on his part. Um, the fact that we're going to be losing him, uh, I know he's left a good team behind him, is kind of sad, uh, but I think he'll be a little bit closer to the pulse of Asmo Day, North America, and FFG, which are... So yeah, those are those are some nice kind of shakeups that are happening. Um, one thing that's really reassuring me is um, we're seeing Tyler more and more. When we started, we had Brad, had your two guys, Bad me, I should know. Um, yeah. Eric Dahlman and uh, who's, the, who's the designer that they have locked away that does everything? Yeah. Um, him. Him. Damn. Yes. Um, but it, yeah, so we started losing a few of those early on, and then we lost Katrina, uh, who I don't think is ever going to be able to be properly replaced. Um, but And then I think we kind of lost Brad going over to the Key Forge at some point. But Tyler has stepped in. We were all a little bit nervous about getting brand new blood. I know we joked about him being the intern. Uh, twice. But I have to admit, like, some of the stuff he... Like, seeing him talk about things, hearing the interactions that players have had with him, seeing um, the actual product that he's finally got his hands on, so getting to see some of the, the card interactions of Children of the Empire, and the restricted list came out today, but also an updated rules reference. And there's a lot of changes and updates and kind of tidying that to me suggests that uh, Tyler's finally getting a chance to kind of put his mark and kind of put things um, so the fact that we have a dedicated our dedicated designer who made it to El Favor and is that's his one core focus. I know he does some other support with some of the other games, but I think we can Tyler to have the El Favor LCG core front and center going I think that so uh, the designers were Nate French, who I think is in a box somewhere. Um, doing, doing everything. They seem to have so much. Yeah, Brad, who's really off the key forge, and Eric Dahlman, who left. Uh, yeah, we didn't really get much info, but no, I think he, he, he obviously was in for the initial design. And yeah. Went to Brighter Bastards. So we have entered the glorious Tyler era. Yeah. And look, it looks bright so far. Um, you know, obviously there'll be a couple of cataclysms along the way, and we can uh, break out the pitchforks as we, as a player base, always do. But um, we're we're Absolutely. definitely hopeful. He'll he'll lose the dressing room at some stage and be hunted around the place with a set of pitchforks, or be hired by Watsy for a lot of money. You know, these are the things. These are the the life cycle of uh, CCG design. Yep, that's the cycle of life. And then we'll um, have the glorious, I don't know, Jack Murray restoration or something. It'll be great. All right. Um, what do we want to talk about next? 
kind of drifted through a bundle of different things there. I think the release talk schedule... About the results from Madrid. Oh, Madrid, oh, yeah. We could talk about the release schedule. Uh, I think it's interesting because they're definitely doing... We're doing Crane, we're doing Unicorn... No, sorry, we're doing Children. Yeah. We're doing Unicorn. Yeah. We're doing Crane. Then I think they're doing six packs in six yeah. months. And then after that, they're going to do Lion, Crab, Dragon. So that means that every month until November, we've got product lined up. So it's going to be one a month. It's going to be really, really regular, which is a, a, a fairly big departure from what we were doing, the kind of punctuated spasm of content nothing spasm of content nothing we're going to get a, a kind of a, a fairly consistent more cards more cards more cards more cards or books good cards or books yeah yeah well do we so we're, we're we're consistently getting the the new story book um every time there's a clamp back so long may they continue doing so far um and yeah more yeah because this because the I don't always notice when the the RPG releases go up because they're in a different kind of stream. But we could also see you know another another board game along the lines of Battle Rock again or anything like that, like outside of the the LCG stuff. There's there's a, kind of a lot of different options, a lot of things that I'm working on. Calendars. There's an L five or calendar. Yeah, to that. I saw that. It's wacky. You know. It doesn't have any of the release dates in it, unfortunately. Uh, it's just a sticker. Like, it's just a sticker. It seems like a <laughs> seems like a missed opportunity, though. Seriously, really does. I mean, you know, but buy your buy your FFG calendar and find out the year's release. <laughs> it's it's a marketing plan made in heaven. Tiny. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, let's let's have a quick look over at Madrid. Um. So the another another win for Jakob. Another win for a scorpion, and um, they pretty much dominated the the second day. Um, Forty one percent of those who qualified for the second day were scorpion players. And crane and phoenix were each nineteen percent, crab, dragon, and line each sixteen percent, and then just one scorpion qualified. And then as the kind of ranks up, you could see it would typically you were looking at about fifty percent scorpion all the way through from from that onwards. Um but Shadowblade, that's the line player, so that's Fernando Castanon Aran, uh, who we've seen before. We've seen him at Birmingham and uh, as Owen was reminding me earlier, he uh, was actually second place at Madrid last year as well. But he brought line all the way at this against all of the odds i have to admit that was really so um line fine good message andy <laughs> uh so you got to be careful one of the things that's really reassuring about this game is that the the good players consistently do well which is a great argument for skill being very important in the game the game not being hugely random so you have to be careful about attributing a single excellent pilot to being oh the, the you know the clan's environmental problems have been worked out. Uh, you know, Shalbert Fernando is a really good player. Um, he's consistently a really good player. He consistently does well in places. So I wouldn't be like, up oh, line are fine. Everyone else needs to just learn to play. So much as he's a really good pilot, he knows how to get the most out of line, and I think he plays in a really tough environment. So that's great yeah. for getting better. So I would more take the view of it of, yep, yeah, he's really good. He's doing really well at it. And, you know, rather than saying, oh, yeah, this clearly indicates that Lion are perfectly fine. You know, all these other results can be ignored safely, you know. Uh, we, we've kind of ended up coming full circle because I remember a year ago we were talking about how Pablo with Crab had won Madrid. And uh, just prior to that, Owen, you'd made a compelling case that uh, Crab were not in a great situation and needed some help. And uh, Pablo had to ruin all of that for everyone. Oh, yeah, as usual. You know, that's my, that's my life. You know, people are like, but this, the single data point disproves your thesis. I was like, I'm not convinced it does. 
But sure, you know, yeah, you know, the pearl, you know, the pearl of anecdote is data, right? No, it is not. Uh, so yeah, so it's always, you know, it's always fun, and we'll, we'll see what happens. Though I mean, you know, that that scorpion number, the qualification number, which is what you're kind of going to look at, was getting a bit toxic, and I'd say. You know, that, that may have played in a little bit to the timing of the release of the restricted list. Just a little bit of, you know, let's do something now before a narrative gets established. Uh, so, you know, something was done. Hopefully, hopefully for the better. So what, do you, what do you think, Justin? How do you, how do you feel about uh, the, the, the event and even Phoenix performance? Phoenix... Felt like they were pretty good, but again, aren't really stepping up to it. No, no, we're you know they they seem to be doing yeah. I mean, obviously, like it's it's a very very good qualification rate on par with Cranes. Um, but uh, once they get to the top eight, uh, things just go wrong, and they tend not to get much further. Um, I mean, we've had uh, Travis do well in the states, but he keeps on running into a kneel in the final. So obviously, that's a you know, it's a it's, problem. It's, yeah, it's not exactly. Yeah, not not exactly who you want to see sitting across from you uh, in a final. Um, but yeah, it's I. Uh, you know, I don't know. As I said, I I I don't know what the exact um, matchup data was from the uh, from the Cote. I think it showed Phoenix had a, a positive matchup against Crane, a negative, a slightly negative matchup against Scorpion. Um, uh, but generally, but generally, Phoenix were more or less kind of where. Very very close to fifty fifty across the board. Yeah, which yeah. Um, so slight, yeah, slightly slightly um, negative, one, yeah. slightly negative to lion and scorpion, and positive to crane crab, and everything else is wrong. Yeah, yeah. So, which I mean can be part of the problem. I mean, if you've got a clan that's fifty fifty across the board, then yeah, sure, you, the, the you know just the number of people that show up, you're going to get people to qualify. But if your matchups is, matchups are fifty fifty. Then uh, at some point you're going to fall victim to that as uh, fall victim to that as well. So um, so yeah, that might explain how uh, how Phoenix are you know getting into the cuts but just not making it that much further. But you know, on and all, I you know can't really complain. I mean, the Phoenix are probably close to the poster child of what uh, a clan should look like. You know, with all their matchups hovering around the fifty percent mark. So yeah, I don't know. I think I like I think it's a matter of time before Phoenix do make a breakthrough. Um, you know, they if they, the like the, the the deck is good, it's strong, it has it's it you know it has no bad matchups. So eventually, eventually, a Phoenix deck is going to break through. Um, but just just but, after uh, having a look at the had a look at a top cut for Madrid, and every Phoenix went out to a Scorpion deck. Um, I mean, obviously, yeah. Scorpion decks were everywhere, but um, how much of a difference is the restricted list changes going to make? Let's assume uh, Scorpion are. Just running four G dict and they take everything else out. Uh, well, if they, I mean, losing losing a fate worse than death is is quite a blow, or it can be quite a blow. Um, like it depends very much. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's because I like I as I said I I from from my personal experience in like over the over the last kind of few kind of weeks and months playing, I think Phoenix actually have quite a quite a decent matchup against Scorpion. Um, but that said, you know, I'm not playing. I'm not playing against uh, the Jacobs of the world every day. So that, of course, could, you know, yeah, what yeah. what you think could be a, a positive matchup may turn out to be horribly misinformed. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, with like Scorp Scorpion are losing another significant uh, power card. Um, in well, I mean, that they have a choice between Forged Edict and a Fate Worse Than Death. And honestly, faced with that, uh, they may opt to keep a fate worse than death and sub out Forge Deep for something like Censure, um, which isn't quite as good, but maintains the the functionality of their deck much more, uh, or you know, it keeps their 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 deck much more cohesively focused than losing a fate worse than death would. Um, so it's sorry, yeah, Owen. I think that it's. If Phoenix could go, okay, we're playing this, and now we're going to run Censure, you're a much better place than Scorpion matchup. Because the previous problem was the Phoenix, who often could often had a big, towery guy, was really scary, and you wanted to avoid him getting slammed with a Fate Worse Than Death, you were you were in a tough spot, because they are probably going to slam him, and even if you cancel the Fate Worse Than Death, they could forge Edict, and now they don't have as many options. Because only one yeah. of you is going to be able to censure at a time. 
So I can see the Scorpion Phoenix matchup, favorite control becoming really important in it. And Phoenix are pretty good at that. Like Scorpion will have some uh, have some tricks as well because they have a person who, when she leaves play, takes the favor, who yeah. hasn't seen a lot of play, but might see a bit more play mm. in that situation if she... control the favor becomes. Slant I just. Think she tends to... I, I think she tends to see play as a two of in in yeah. most most Scorpion decks. Um, maybe not all, but but I'd say most. Um, I hear I hear some slots just I, opened up as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. And um, to be honest, I found that for me the, the the matchups against Scorpion come down to Master of D Satoshi and Tadaka much more than than anything else. Um, if you get the Master of Satoshi down, then <clears throat> Scorpion have a, a an incredibly hard time defending against you because you know it's it's a it's a it's a one sided guest of honor essentially. You can just sit there and play out your spells and boost your guys up to province cracking strength, and there's nothing they can do to stop you. Um, and oh. obviously, Tadaka when he lands, if he lands, kind of turn three plus, then he can shut off most of their fate hand and just you know significantly limit their options. So. Like a lot of the time, it comes down to just the the, the variance of when those cards show up. Um, certainly, uh, yeah, that's that tends to be my experience. If you if you don't see them, it's it's a much much harder game. Uh, but if you do see them, then the game is significantly easier. Uh, but I mean, there's things like you know the 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 turn one automatic forged edict on your display of power or something like that is is backbreaking potentially. Um, or at least, you know, it prevents you from even considering that uh, as a as an option. So, um, so yeah, no, it's it's going to be very interesting to see which direction uh, Scorpion players choose to go, um, and whether or not this is going to actually push Scorpion players away slightly from the the courtier heavy builds more toward a Shinobi build, which, um, you know, was already kind of stretched to include Forged Edict as it was. I don't know. I mean, it's it's. It's, it's it's really really interesting. I mean, one of the things I I really like about the restricted list is like when you take a look at um, what they're doing to to dragon, which is essentially they're they're splitting dragon into two decks. You've got the attachment deck and you've got the monk deck, as opposed to the you know good stuff Franken deck that uh, that is the dragon standard right now. Um, for for scorpion again, they do seem to be dividing the deck fairly fairly strongly between uh, a courtier deck or a, a shinobi deck. Maybe not as strongly, but they're I think there's you know a general downpowering of Scorpion um, that may compel some Scorpion players to consider Shinobi over um, the uh, over the courtier version. Uh, yeah, um, so it seems like the, the 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 really the kind of big power decks, um, the kind of the, the two big clans, which I would have said were Scorpion and Dragon, uh, are being compelled to, to to vary their game up a little bit and vary their decks up a little bit. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's I mean it's I it's definitely I mean the the restricted list is definitely going to have an effect on on how how efficiently uh, Scorpion play out um, because having to choose between Forged Edict and um, a fate worse than death that is a very very painful choice. Um, you know, giving away your guaranteed counter is a big deal. Giving away a fate worse than death maybe an even bigger deal. So it's uh, it, yeah interesting times for Scorpion players for sure. And just just looking at it from the dragon side of things, um, the dragon players are working on multiple. Different yeah, There's actually, different options are kind of different things. Yeah, can play. I don't think any clan has been has basically been cut out of stuff and then goes yeah. well. I've only got this left to play. Everyone yeah. are, are have options and have things, to which is pretty exciting because it does mean I if one. Oh no no! I, just, I was just going to say sorry, uh, and I actually think I, one of the one of the most um, important things about the Neaton Master Void Fist restriction is that with Pathfinder's Blade on the restricted list as well, it means that Dragon are no longer locked into Crab Splash, which opens up a huge range of deck building options by necessity. So that is also a hugely positive, uh, a hugely positive spin. You know, I'm kind of hoping that they. The, the Tyler can pull off something similar for for Phoenix, because Phoenix are basically locked into Dragon Splash, um, and it would be wonderful to not feel compelled to have to play Dragon in every competitive deck. And so, is that is that for the attachment control? Yep, basically. Yeah. Let yeah. go. Let go is too important. Because we've we've already seen a few cards um, coming out, like Hand the Hand, I think was one of them. 
okay. where more attachment options or more attachment control options were kind of exciting, I think. Um, yeah, definitely welcome. Uh, something like hand to hand, I'm not convinced about for Phoenix because you can't guarantee you're going to be in a situation where you're they're not going to be able to blow up your uh, your cloud the mind. Um, so, like that's a card that works really really well if you are not playing attachments yourself. So it's uh, but yeah, I mean, but again, like more more solutions, more options would be wonderful. Like I said, not not feeling absolutely compelled to play dragon would be a wonderful thing. So fingers crossed. Um, so maybe we'll have a look on at the new Shadowland as as our Cooney, Cooney expert. I think maybe you should take the lead on this one. Absolutely. So the RPG is cracking ahead. Uh, it announced the. It previously had. It's had the core book out. It's had the GM screen out. It's had some the starter box with its adventure on. So they've had two kind of short adventures. I was having a look through the GM screen one because I was very interested in what the GM screen adventure looked like because they had a couple of slightly more modern RPG design elements in it in the beta, and not all of them survived into the main one about the ways to structure scenes and very kind of systemized ways that like a debate becomes a fight more or less and some of that kind of went away in the book and i was interested in just seeing what an adventure would look like because what an adventure looks like has you an incredibly large amount about how the game is meant to be played or what's the intention for the kind of things that happen in the game yeah. and especially with the narrative dice they use in it they're not as not narrative in the same way that the uh, Genesis or Star Wars dice are. They're narrative in a different way, but you want examples of that as a GM about how in play you use the system to evoke the setting and how the game is meant to feel to play. So they have the Emerald Empire, which is kind of like, let's explain the Empire to people book, which I'm always very glad to see. I think it's coming up next. That's out uh, soon. this week. Out this week. Yeah. Awesome. Pick that up. Um, the other thing that they're bringing out, they've, and it's two things, both of which really excited me, actually, because I'm a proud player of art. The first one is an adventure, Mask of the Oni, which is an adventure in the Shadowlands. And it's actually an adventure somewhere that there's never been an adventure set before, which is in the ruins of Haruma Castle. Oh, where your cool. players have to go to Haruma Castle deep in the Shadowlands and presumably find something important or, you know, save something or, you know, get the heck out of Dodge as fast as you can because this is the most, one of the most dangerous places you can, you can be. So it's an incredibly exciting setting. For, like, this is like, this is doing gun, big guns immediately. This is a huge adventure to consider to put out. Because only, if this isn't really dangerous, if there isn't a genuine threat of death or corruption or destruction from this, you can, anyone can just wander in and out of the Shadowlands. This is the kind of adventure that should be high lethality or high danger. Yeah. And everyone should be told there's a good chance you don't come out of this one. Um, and I'd be very interested to see how dangerous it actually is. Because if I was doing this one, it would be, no, this is very dangerous. This is a very questionable decision to go here. So it's interesting to see that. I'm very excited to see that adventure, to see how dangerous it is. And as a companion book to that, they've got their standard, one of their big format, 144-page uh, hardcovers, which is the Shadowlands, which is going to show, uh, serve as both a primer for the Shadowlands and, I think, a bunch of additional information and, uh, and options for crab players, it looks like. So again, really interesting. And now, This is a daring product to put out. Because in the history of the Elf War RPG, some of the strongest supplements have been the Shadowlands books. So the Book of the Shadowlands and Bears of Jade, despite being very divisive, Bears of Jade is a very much a bit of a marmite of a product. I think it's one of the best RPG books ever written. They're very strong, evocative parts of the setting. Uh, Bears of Jade is very controversial. I know it's not to everybody's taste. Some people felt it made the Shadowlands way too important. But 
it's great to see them going and doing this one. And I was just looking through some of the art here. There's some really cool art here, but there's also an interior, which is actually a kind of a cutaway interior of some of the parts of the Caillou Wall, which are really cool to take a look at. It's uh, the Watt Tower. Yeah. So there's there's great potential here for something really, really cool. Um, so if they, if these leave up to the, live up to what they could be, this is awesome. Now, somewhat more controversially, I've noticed that both the End of the Shadowlands book and Mask of the Oni come with a minor pre-order bonus. All right? So if you pre-order through their website, you get a bookmark and you get some uh, five by seven art prints. So you get uh, eight of them with the Book of the Shadowlands and you get, I think, five of them or four of them in the, uh, the adventure. So the question is, do you have to order through the FFG website to get them? Or will there be an option for us outside of America to order them through our local, friendly local game shop and get them that way? Because I quite like some of those art prints. Yeah, I've, I've looked at the option of ordering some stuff off the FFG site before, especially when they have their, their yearly sale. And good. Uh, postage awesome. and packaging is ridiculous. It is insane. Um, but yeah, just getting back to the, the books, they've really hit the high points. I mean, the, that main core book that they've had, I, I certainly felt... Um, you know, lived up to the reputation of the fourth edition one, which is one of the most beautiful and most fantastic books that I've had up until this new one, which I think is fantastic also. Uh, they then immediately are going into Emerald Empire, and the Emerald Empire fourth edition book was amazing. Now they're going to the Shadowlands book, as you said, is kind of um, you know, it's one of the, the kind of better products out there. It kind of feels like they're they're cherry picking all of the good ones to go straight into. But I notice uh, in the, the write-up for this, it, the, the very final chapter is all about uh, GMing horror uh, themes. And now I know they're saying this running campaigns in the Shadowlands, um, but I've always really felt that horror is a, quite a central element uh, to the L5 or RPG that it doesn't always come up. The Last Province podcast, which anyone listening that hasn't had a chance to listen to any of their seven hour episodes uh, is absolutely fantastic because they they really really get into lore and into the story but they were talking about the mirror mirror adventure have you seen that one on uh, i've i've run mirror mirror and i've played mirror mirror it is fabulous however it is an intimidating adventure to play it's an intimidating adventure to run the chance of death or destruction happening to you are high. Um, like one of the opening scenes I've described it before is you go in to meet with Hedic Sada and you have to kneel uh, with your head down on the ground in front of him. And you're at the line of where the, his chamber, he's got a row of uh, curtains. And then you notice the curtains are metal and they're razor sharp. So if you annoy him, he'll shut the curtains on you and cut your head off. And that's the kind of the tone that starts off that adventure. You're in trouble if you mess up. And you really are. Like, there's a bunch of things happen. And if you know, understand Rakugan, you very quickly realize, uh-oh, we're in trouble here. Just for an example, one of the players in it turned himself invisible as he was a Shigenja, snuck into somebody's room, found a bunch of evidence, turned himself invisible again, snuck back out, came to us and said, look at all this evidence I found. And I said, that's nice, that's useless. <laughs> and he said, what? He said, that's evidence. We need testimony. If we accuse her of that, she's going to deny that's hers, and there'll be nothing there. What we have to do is put that back in her room now and get someone more important than her to search the room and find it. <laughs> so he turned himself invisible again and go sneak back in. It was great. It, it certainly, certainly is a learning curve. Um, but yeah, the, the Mask of the Oni being set in Haruma, uh, the, the Haruma castle, um, really, I, I kind of feel like maybe they're they're trying to harken back to Mirror Mirror. Like, it'll be interesting to see how they do it, um, but to, yeah. to go straight into a horror adventure as, what, essentially the first adventure out of the, the starter and GM box, uh, that's, it's, it's a brave move. It is. It's very, it's very ambitious because... That's a high bar to start yourself off looking to clear. Um, hopefully, it it lives up to the hype because I, I am hyped about that adventure. Yeah, I mean, uh, legitimately so. Uh, I uh, also so. I also note that the Shadowlands book 
seems to expand on the crab background. So they've got uh, some extra background for the Hida, Kaiu, Kuni, Suki, and Hurum. Uh, so I'm wondering if we're going to see this as a, a theme going forward, that the, the Shadowlands book expands upon the crab. Maybe there'll be a, a war battle book that's going to expand upon the lion. We might see a courtly intrigue. Um, I guess that could be oh a curly intrigue and dueling shall we say that'll expand upon the crane and and so on and so forth uh, so you'll you'll have so rather than having the kind of clan books that you might have before that kind of lose out if you're totally focused on one instead you've got different uh major themes where you still have all of your, your clan story oh and maho maho in this <laughs> there's always more maho it's interesting, Mask of the Oni is an adventure booklet. I don't think it's a full... It's not a hardcover. Oh, okay. But it comes with tokens and stuff. I wonder, is it in a hard box like the starter? Go pre-order it. Not in the shop. Tell us anything. Well, that's what I was looking at in the shop. Whereas the Shadowlands is a hardcover book, uh, Mask of the Oni, I think it's a booklet. Yeah. Because it comes with a map and it comes with tokens to represent the uh, monsters you're going to end up fighting. Okay. Do we have a page stamp on it yet? Mm, no. I was looking for that as well. Okay. Still, much excitement. Absolutely. I'm just wondering. I'm just curious. Um, and that will be first quarter of 2019. Ultimately, next three months or so. Months. Yeah, if it's out for uh, if it's out for the code, I'll run. I'll I'll raffle off or run a thing for it. That'd be cool. A session of people. Yeah, awesome. All right. Do we have anything else we want to cover, or are we feeling like uh, done a good job today? I think we've you know we've got going again. That's the important bit. Um, I'd say. Hmm. We're gonna have a lot to talk about when the previews start properly for the new packs. Yeah. And I'd say that could start churning out to us soonish. Soonish. Well, now I have the power. I might I might try some more pictures next time and see if my, my machine can handle it. Maybe the occasional browser to look at things. We'll, we'll <laughs> step up. Do we have a beaver fact? My goodness, my goodness. Do, or or should, should we, and I know this is controversial, should we consider a different animal for 2019? We could consider one, uh, but I'd have to get a new textbook. Um, I actually saw something about beavers there recently I was looking at. There was, uh, yeah, they were engineering the tundra. Um, that the Canadian tundra was being completely reshaped. But yeah, the, sorry, the Alaskan tundra is being completely reshaped by the beavers. And as a result of that, it's become much more hospitable to wildlife. That's interesting because they may actually be the keystone species there or becoming a keystone species there that are kind of transforming how it works. And that's really interesting um, because you have species like that occasionally that just are ridiculously important, you know. So they are taking over there and they may add more biodiversity with the additional ponds or create oasises where there's fish and amphibians will leave or the migratory waterfowl are going to stop there.